raise anywhere from half a million to a couple of million dollars just in that phase because it was an interesting idea. You also invested yourself? It was just crazy. Um, what's next is trying to solve large corporation and government problems about innovation. Are you close to the solution? Yeah, it's a, it's a great time to experiment. Happy to help. I really like this. Did I answer any of your question or did I kind of go off on something? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Good day to everyone. This is in my channel with the best first hand content for startup founders and tech entrepreneurs. And today I want to put a little bit in trigger. So look what Forbes says about our guest today. Entrepreneur turned educator. He is the father of modern entrepreneurship. Credited with launching the lean startup movement, he has changed how startups are built, how entrepreneurship is taught, how science is commercialized, and how companies and the government innovate. Impressive, isn't it? So meet our guest today. Steve Blank. Hi, Steve. Hi, thanks for having me, Nelly. <laughs> Thank you, it's an honor for, to have you. How are you? I'm great. Uh, uh, you know, we're all locked up, uh, still sequestering and, uh, and hiding away from that virus, uh, hoping it can't find us. We are glad that things are going quite fast and uh, it seems that pandemic will be um, will be relieved very soon, but it does not seem that the market will be uh, will feel relief uh, the same fast. Uh, what do you think uh, about uh, the ongoing situation on the markets? What I mean here is that uh, we've seen the drop down and then we've seen rising again, but most of the experts they are forecasting uh, the big recession in the nearest uh, months. Yeah, well, at least in the United States, the, the stock market seems to be disconnected from uh, from kind of the reality of what's going on uh, with businesses themselves. Um, so as far as the stock market's concerned, uh, I can't figure it out. As, as far as businesses are concerned, I think uh, the unemployment numbers in the United States are, are, are pretty, uh, pretty frightening. And... Uh, and I'm afraid every forecast about what's going to happen to the market um, is going to be as accurate as the forecast as what's going to happen with the virus. Um, you know, no one's been right so far. My personal prediction is uh, uh, we're in for at least a year, of, if not more, of uh, a kind of a downturn in a way that uh, we probably haven't seen in 20, at least 20 years, if not longer. Steve. Uh, as we just said uh, during the introduction, um, you are the author of a lot of books and the father of entrepreneurship and the father of Lean Startup Movement. How do you think, being a father, um, can your Lean Startup Movement and the knowledge and experience which you've shared in many books and methodologies of startup development can be implemented specifically uh, during this crisis situation? Uh, in order to avoid uh, the crash of technological businesses and startup businesses and in order to uh, survive these crisis times? Well, you know, I think, uh, I think it's pretty clear to most people running businesses, whether they're startups or, or existing companies, that, uh, you know, you either act or the market will act for you. Um, and, and you need to basically... Uh, you know, take action, um, but not action for panic or not action for complaints, you know, sitting around. You need to do an assessment, to, uh, starting with the great questions you asked, is how long do you think this is going to last to your business and your market? <clears throat> if you're in travel or entertainment or a small business or a restaurant, I mean, it, you know, it's been happening to you. Now, the question is, what does recovery look like and when does it come? And you're going to have to take your best assessment of what's going on around you uh, um, and your business. And you also have to look around and to other external factors. Or is your government and, and region providing assistance, uh, economic assistance to, to companies and, and others? 
And then you need to look quickly internally is uh, what's, your, what's your burn rate? That is how much cash you're spending each month and how much do you have left? So that's called your runway. Um, and what's happened to, to customer sales or orders or anything else? And, and, and this is the only time where, where I would say don't trust your VPs of sales, rosy fo forecast. Um, if I was the CEO, I'd be on the phone with them calling your top customers if you're business to business, asking how their customers are doing because your business is predicated on theirs and whether they're laying off people. You know, if you're selling to consumers, you've gotten the message directly in a, in a B2C business because either your business has dropped off a cliff or in the rare case, it's it's gone up. And then you, uh, you need to uh, figure out what the new business model is. And that is, what's the new business model for, for in the middle of the pandemic? And, and uh, do you need to pivot into a different one for recovery? That is, is consumer behavior or customer behavior going to change permanently? Um, is this just a temporary halt? Um, is there a way to take advantage of, of some of these changes? Um, and then you need to make changes rapidly to your company to move that model. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest thing for entrepreneurs and existing companies is to have cash flow that will last you at least two years. That is, if you don't have that amount of cash, um, you need to figure out how to get it. And if you're a startup, you know, you were depending on having multiple funding rounds uh, going on. I'm not sure that's... Uh, the venture business is going to be in the same place either when this recovery comes. A good number of them are spending their money trying to support their later stage investments that were the most valuable, but at the same time might have dropped off a cliff. Um, good examples are Airbnb and Lyft and others who, you know, were great businesses the first of March and are now some of the biggest cash sinks, you know, meaning, you know, money just pours in and out and are laying off tons of people. But if you're an investor in, 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 you know, in Airbnb, you need to support that company with hundreds of millions of dollars. Therefore, that's money that, that's no longer available for earlier investments. I don't know if I answered your question. Sorry about the soliloquy. <laughs> you answered it quite clearly, but uh, I'm a little bit upset. Uh, I, I think that it is quite uh, pessimistic or maybe realistic. Uh, I, I don't know how to call it, but do you see any positive, uh, any, any positive movements or any positive influence uh, from the current situation on the market, or not yet, not really? Well, you know, I've now seen, uh, you know, now that this has been going on for uh, a month or two, depending on where you live, um, I've seen some really innovative business models uh, for uh, uh, both small businesses, uh, larger companies, etc where people actually have pivoted and, and have discovered that, what a surprise, you could do virtually what, what you thought was only a physical in-person business. You know, um, entertainers who did kids' birthdays, for example, you would think, well, those people are out of business. Well, it turns out that kids still have birthdays and parents, even though they're locked up with their kids, want some entertainment for their young kids. And I've now seen a good number of them actually go virtual. And if you're a four-year-old kid, it's pretty normal to see somebody, you know, on the screen, but now they're saying your name. What a surprise. And, and so the most innovative ones have figured out um, uh, how to use, uh, you know, uh, Zoom and, and other, uh, um, uh, other ways to, to sell their business digitally. Uh, you know, others who have been in the lucky place of of seeing their businesses grow, home delivery, some types of software companies, et cetera, have found out that this is the world's most perfect time to pick up assets they never could have acquired. Great people starting number one, great people number two, great people number three, but then physical assets or supplies or resources that just are never available. And so, you know, note to memo to people who do have cash in the bank, now's the time to even overhire um, people you never could have thought you would have gotten because they're not going to be available before or be available later. Um, and then I've, I've also suggested to others that um, particularly individuals early in their career as entrepreneurs or those still in school, that now's a you know, good time to 
think about what you really want to do with the rest of your life. You know, in an opportunity crisis, there's always an opportunity. Here's the opportunity to think about, do you want to be the next 500th social media app? Or do you want to maybe pivot to healthcare or life sciences or therapeutics or medical devices? Or, gee, online education has now gotten one heck of a test. You know, it, it, there's huge opportunities to make it better. You know, there are huge opportunities to make uh, video conferencing better. I think we've all been living on Zoom and realized how much we miss on person-to-person -person communication. Um, and, uh, and I think there's huge opportunities to build next generation's video products. And I also think that, again, some of these changes are going to be permanent. Um, people are going to realize that, no, not every sales call needs to be in person. Um, you know, I, I, I'm now convinced that if you're doing prospecting in person, you're probably wasting your time and are probably going to be some of the least efficient salespeople. But I think on the other hand, we've proven for high value deals, unless you're watching somebody's body language and see whether they're leaning across the table or not, or, you know, it will differentiate great salespeople and big ticket item sales are still going to happen in person. I think conferences of thousands of people or tens of thousands are at least a year or two off. I'm not sure how you have a CES or massive mobile shoot, you know, show in Barcelona or somewhere else um, with 100,000 people in town for a long time. Um, yeah, so those for are two years it is canceled, for two years minimum. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, so, so those types of things are gonna impact not only local economies, but national economies. And, and I'm not sure they're ever gonna come back. Are you not gonna have rock concerts with 100,000 people, you know, even if they're wearing masks, unless we want to reignite the, the virus again. <clears throat> and, and again, all the stuff we don't know, we don't know if this is going to be seasonal like the flu, um, just more deadly, and, and our lives are going to change permanently, or whether this is a one-time event. So um, there's a lot we still don't know, but if, if you have to make payroll, there is a lot you know, which is how much cash do I have back in the bank? And um, and so I think for back to entrepreneurs, I think you really need to be considering whether your your business is going to be still viable in the new normal. Um, you, you know, um, prayers are not a strategy. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, while you might start as a faith-based enterprise, uh, you now quickly need to translate into a fact-based company. And so that's my two cents. Steve, and uh, did you uh, do the same exercise? Did it make uh, you to think over if you want uh, to continue with the workshops, lectures, teaching, or maybe switch to uh, something else? You already pivoted one time from entrepreneur uh, to the professor, teacher, and uh, thought leader. Well, you know, I, I certainly didn't pivot on, on purpose to thought leader. I, I just had some thoughts and other people followed. So, uh, um, but, but I did make a, a slight pivot. Um, next month, we're going to be offering um, hacking for the recovery set of classes at Stanford, five day pop-up classes for small businesses, for people in travel and hospitality, for people in entertainment. So uh, first a general five day pop-up class and all this online. And, and then some general uh, verticals uh, for people in specific industries to do what I've just been talking about is how do you come up with new business models? How do you quickly test them? What do they look like, et cetera? And uh, we put together a pretty good teaching team and uh, uh, we'll, you know, we'll take a, a hundred or maybe a couple hundred uh, students per five day class. So maybe we could reach a, a couple thousand people and, and training them pretty quickly. Oh. Online, yes, everything online. online. Yes, 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 yes. And it will be for free, or it will be for some money. Um, you know, it's it's through Stanford, so I'm not sure the word free applies, but but hopefully, hopefully we'll try to make it free. Um, we'll see what the university does. Uh, but we're going to take our teaching team for who, t who teaches our lean launchpad and hacking for defense classes and. Um, and take that world-class team and, and, uh, and put it across these problem sets and see if we, instead of just, you know, blah, 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 actually show people how to kind of change business models and what are the new opportunities. 
And I think we're all going to learn as much from them as, as they are from us. We'll, we'll, we'll share with them a rapid methodology to kind of do this and test models. And, and, and I think the output will be a new set of models that could be shared across the entire community. Think of this as a giant lab for um, business segments to see, well, what are the new opportunities and, and what can one be doing? And, in these sets of verticals um, in the new normal of, uh, of operating when you can't be uh, in close proximity to others for a while. Um, I think that's an interesting uh, experiment. So no, I haven't, the answer is I haven't changed my life. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of happy with mine and lucky enough not to, not to need that. But um, obviously I'm, uh, you know, I'm not very good at sewing masks and I don't know how to make ventilators, but I knew, do know how to generate classes and potential um, new ideas. So that's, uh, that's going to be our contribution. And I think the recovery is going to be as important as the, as the cure, uh, because, uh, you know, having 20% unemployment is going to kill as many people possibly as, as the virus. And, and uh, that's not a good thing either. So we need to figure out how to reconfigure, not just, you know, individual businesses and not just the uh, market segments, but we're going to need to figure out how to reconfigure economies uh, to adapt and adopt. And, and uh, hopefully we could help doing that. And speaking about reconsidering economies, maybe you also need to make workshops for governments or for the White House? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pass on that question. <laughs> Okay, uh, actually, um, tell me if you want to pass another question as well, because I just wanted to refer to this uh, brief introduction from Forbes, and uh, it stated that you also, your methodology also changed uh, the way how governments innovate. I just uh, wanted to uh, dig a little bit deeper into that and ask you, uh, what were exact examples, so maybe without naming countries, if you are uh, not allowed to name um, particular countries or regions, uh, how did they implement uh, lean startup methodology in order to innovate uh, on this big uh, government scale? Yeah, I'll start with the US and then kind of move outward. Um, so I started, a, uh, just for your, um, viewers and listeners who are not familiar with the uh, lean methodology, I'll just remind them in, in 30 seconds and, and stop me if you think they all know it. But, awesome. but, but lean was kind of a reaction to the last um, internet uh, dot com crash at the turn of the 21st century. It, the way we used to build startups is hard to believe, but in the 20th century when I was an entrepreneur, investors without ever saying these words said startups are nothing more than smaller versions of larger companies. So they said, if you were a founder, everything a large company does, we want you to do. They write five-year forecasts and five-year plans. We want you to do that. You know, they hire sales and biz dev and marketing on day one. We want you to do that. And, and engineering, when you're building your product, we want you to use waterfall engineering, which was the only methodology, which was come up with a spec and the spec to engineering. And, and by the way, the product spec would come from the founder's brain and co-founders. They brainstorm inside their building and argue inside of conference rooms about what features. And then engineering would lock themselves up and use a development methodology that said develop, alpha test, beta test, first customer ship. And the first time you would get serious customer feedback was when you ship the product. And, and so you, you would take a year or so to develop products because that were hard to believe, no open source, no GitHub, no you know, Stack Exchange, nothing. Um, and then you would finally get customer feedback after you've burned a lot of cash and, and time. That was the 20th century model. And of course, what a surprise. It was a real waste of time and resources because the founders, you know, while smart, were the smartest people in the building, but they were not smarter than the collective intelligence of potential customers who they were not talking to. Um, and so lean came from my experience when I retired that said, well, that's not how startups who actually win do that. Startups who win actually talk to customers early on. Why don't we do that? So the first part of lean startup was a customer development methodology, a way to kind of formalize, huh, why don't we just say that all we have on day one are a set of untested hypotheses, which is a fancy word for we're just effing guessing about 
customers and features and pricing and whatever, we might have a considered opinion, but number two is there are no facts inside the building, so get the heck outside. And so customer development said, why don't we early on in this process do something radically different, which is instead of thinking we were the smartest people, realize that smart people exist outside. And then step two was uh, Eric Ries, um, one of the best students I ever had and became the first practitioner of customer development said, Steve, you know, in the 21st century, people are starting to do agile engineering, which is build products iteratively and incrementally. Instead of doing waterfall, you know, we now have software and even hardware tools to kind of, you know, build, test, you know, find, course correct, et cetera. Why don't we pair that with customer development? And so now Lean became customer development and Eric's observation about Agile. And then the third part was uh, about five years later, someone named Alexander Osterwalder developed something called the business model canvas, which was a way to simply write down all the nine pieces that a founder needs to worry about. Who are the customers? What features do they want? What's the distribution channel? How do you get them, keep them, grow them? What's the revenue model? What are costs, resources, activities, and partners? And once you had that, now you knew what it was you were testing outside the building. And we developed a set of techniques. That is, Agile allowed you to build something called minimum viable products instead of fancy prototypes, little tests. Then we gave you permission to do something you never were, was allowed to do in the 20th century, and that was pivot. And a pivot said, admit you're wrong and change rapidly. And so when we use the word pivot, which now is kind of everybody kind of gets, but, but that was not allowed in the 20th century. You would get fired as a founder if you would have told a VC, I'm changing my model. Um, now in the 21st century, you know, people go, oh, okay, let's discuss a pivot. Hopefully you've done most of those before a series A or a seed round, but, but people expect you to do them. So that's the methodology that we, we call lean. And it's now incredibly relevant to this crisis because we now have the tool set that founders, the large companies, anybody, you know, even in your personal life could, could say, well, wait a minute, I'm sitting here worrying about what I should do. Let me get out of the building, in this case, sometimes mostly virtually, and test some of these new ideas. Let me try little minimum viable products, whether they're mock-ups of a new service or just a PowerPoint of here's what I'm thinking of doing. And let's get some feedback and, and rapidly figure out how to reconfigure our business or our life or our economy or country. And to answer your question, I, I finally, I, I put this together in a class at Stanford in 2011. And here was the game changer. The US government adopted that class as the basis of commercializing all science in the US. Um, it was adopted by our National Science Foundation. Um, and uh, it's still what the original curriculum I wrote and it's called the i core or Innovation Core, taught in 98 universities in the US. We've put, I don't know, probably over 5,000 of our country's best scientists through this from their NSF. There's a, a, a version going on in our National Institute of Health for two divisions there. And then our uh, Department of Defense in, um, adopted it. There's a, a version for our intelligence community. And then I got to travel around to a, a couple countries and, and try it out there. Um, they're still cursing my name in Finland when, when I went around to, and and talked about, you know, at the time there was a government organization to promote entrepreneurship. I, I still thought this was the funniest thing I've ever encountered. And of course, Finland has now completely changed. But when I got there, the government <clears throat> organization called Tekas had more people working in entrepreneurship for the government agency than there were entrepreneurs in Finland. And, and, and I said, I think, I think the ratio should be the other way around. In fact, I said, I think the goal should be to put the government agency out of business and have commercial ventures and venture capital be scaling. And, and by the way, with all credit to the country and whatever. And by the way, this was in the, in the rubble of, of Nokia melting down, um, you know, where they, <clears throat> they were an entrepreneurial nation, but based on essentially this one major company. And out of that, that crisis, of course, uh, the country has done great. Um, um, I, I think you see the same in successful entrepreneurial clusters. 
where the government uh, actually did step in early when they get it right and put themselves out of business. Uh, Israel's a great example. Um, it started with the office of the uh, chief scientist, uh, basically startup nation started there. But now the entrepreneurial culture and ecosystem is way, way larger than, than just the government's efforts in starting a set of, uh, of incubators and accelerators. The same in China. Yeah, China has spent billions and tens of billions of dollars starting um, oh, major programs for innovation and entrepreneurship modeled uh, less so after the U.S. and more after Israel. Um, and most of them failed, but the, the couple that succeeded in Northwest Beijing, Pearl River Valley, et cetera, obviously are economic engines for all of China and, and all the world. Um, so a lot of these tools and techniques have some based on my stuff, some of them based on massive government intervention. Um, some of them have failed miserably uh, for uh, reasons of culture or people or, or you know, uh, it's kind of hard to get, uh, um, an entrepreneurial ecosystem going, um, it's almost uh, directly, uh, inversely proportional to the amount of corruption in a country. Um, it, and uh, if in fact the, you can't win because the person who wins all the time is the, you know, the president's cousin, um, and therefore there isn't uh, somewhat of a meritocracy, or if you can't uh, repatriate uh, your earnings and someone seizes them, um, that really kind of uh, um, eliminates the ability to be entrepreneurial in a nation, not as individuals, but as a, as a culture. Um, and I'm just going to spit out one last thing. What's changed in my lifetime is uh, it used to be that entrepreneurs were limited to areas that had information on how to be entrepreneurs and how to build entrepreneurial systems. And that meant you had to be within coffee distance of people who've done it before. And that's was clusters like Silicon Valley or Boston or New, not even New York at the time, maybe San Diego if you're in the life sciences and, and maybe three or four other places in the world. Well, you know, I laugh because in the last, in my lifetime, entrepreneurship has gone from those places to everywhere. Billions of people now have access to more entrepreneurial information in 20 seconds of Googling than I had in my entire career. That's just mind blowing. The, the only reason we still have entrepreneurial clusters, though, is there's still only 10 or 20 places in the entire world that you could raise $100 million. Uh, and, and so entrepreneurship without risk capital at scale is just one hand clapping. And so it's that combination of risk capital and entrepreneurial culture and, and, and entrepreneurs that make a, uh, the beginnings of a great ecosystem. So I've just been babbling. Uh, did I answer any of your questions? Yeah, and created and uh, generated, I should confess, lots of uh, <laughs> even more questions uh, than I could have before. Uh, that's a very interesting topic, which you just touched, uh, Steve, uh, about entrepreneurship clusters. Uh, because, uh, yes, indeed, there are countries which try to replicate uh, Silicon Valley experience, US experience there. Uh, there are those countries who are fight, um, not fighting, competing uh, for talents, uh, for entrepreneurs, for startups, uh, trying to attract them with uh, various scenarios, uh, from, starting from um, startup visas uh, with a simple uh, visa regime, uh, ending to uh, free offices uh, and some government uh, finance uh, for some period of time. Uh, but still, uh, first of all, Europe is far behind U.S. Uh, in the investment activity. And uh, second, uh, looking at unicorns, um, if we can use this uh, word uh, for assessment of the startup uh, entrepreneurship clusters, the number of unicorns in the U.S. is uh, much higher than anywhere else in the world. So being uh, in the center of all these activities and uh, being the father of entrepreneurship cluster in the US. Uh, how do you think, is it possible to uh, make something uh, bigger and greater or at least uh, the same level of uh, circulation between VC and startups outside the US? You know, it's, it's very funny. It, um... It wasn't until I, I traveled around Europe, I don't know, 
three, four years ago and started talking to people trying to understand exactly that question is why is there such vibrant ecosystems in, um, in, in the U S and, 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 and one is it's, 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 to me, wasn't the obvious. And it, it was the fact, or one of the facts was that um, in the U.S., a big funder of the venture capital funds were what we call pension funds, retirement funds. Um, in, in, and they had the ability to put um, a good chunk of their money into uh, VCs, which funded venture capital funds. You don't have that in Europe. You don't have independent, you have national pension funds but they don't invest in venture capital. Uh, so that is the pool of capital for the investors is kind of missing. And, and so that's a very different ecosystem that exists here. The, the other is, is that um, the culture is different. Um, and, and I think people now understand it. And, but um, in, and I have to tell you, it happened to me personally. And I finally understood the power of this is um, when you fail, in most other countries, um, you have failed. Um, you know, you've shamed yourself, your, your, you know, your community, your parents, you know, they put black crepe around the windows. I mean, they're in mourning, um, you know, but in Silicon Valley and other entrepreneurial clusters, there's a special word for a failed entrepreneur. Do you know what that special word is? No. Experience. <laughs> it, it's a big idea. Um, and, and, and I, I, you know, I, my next to last startup, I was on the cover of something called Wired Magazine and, I, you know, it was famous one, and it failed. It, it like, it was a huge crater public. I mean, it was, I lost back then, it was actually a lot of money, $35 million. But in fact, I had to call my mother and I said, mom, I lost $35 million. And because my mom was a, immigrant and English was still not her first language. She had to think about it for a while. And then she said, well, you lost it. Where'd you put it? And I, said, I said, no, 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 it's gone. And she said, oh, you know, you're going to be in trouble and uh, we're going to have to hide. I said, no, the people who, who, who I lost the money for just gave me another $12 million. Um, and of course, on that one, I returned a billion dollars each to those investors. Now, that's not a steep blank story. That just illustrates this, this notion of, you know, in Silicon Valley and our culture is, if it's an honest failure and you didn't lie, cheat, steal, or whatever, people will truly think you must have learned a lot. And so no one likes to fail. Anybody tells you failure is good, obviously hasn't been through one. Um, it's miserable. It's a terrible experience. But I have to tell you, I did not make the same mistakes again. I mean, the the, you know, the personal mistakes I made in the failure, which I owned, was just hubris. I mean, thinking I was like really smart and whatever and didn't do all the stuff I thought I, I had already been talking about. Um, and so I got those things right and it paid off for my investors. Um, so number one is culture. Number two is part of our culture. And I was just literally on a call with someone from Israel before who said, I couldn't believe I came to the Silicon Valley and everybody here wants to help me without asking for something. And we have this culture called the pay it forward culture, which has kind of gotten diluted in the last decade or so, but it's still here. You'll come out to Silicon Valley and people will say, well, how can we help? And if you haven't been here before, you kind of look, okay, what's, you know, what's the game here? And there really isn't any game because almost everybody has been helped by people before without ask, without having their hand out that said, which I have found in other countries, yeah, I'll help you, but I want, you know, a percent of your company or I want X or Y. You know, here, maybe people would like to invest or maybe they'd like to be on your advisory board, but that's not a precondition to helping you network or, or avoid some of the early mistakes. Does that make sense? So number one is culture about failure. Number two is culture about assistance. Um, and it really is a sense of community here rather than a sense of you're, you're on your own. Um, and as I said, the, the other one was this, um, this lack of capital into venture capital funds from sources that we take for granted in the United States. Um, and, um, and also the culture of the investors themselves. There's a funny story in the, in the U.S., mm -hmm. When we changed the laws about investing in startups way back in the 1970s, 
there were East Coast venture capitalists and West Coast. That is, the East Coast of the United States is the earliest settled part of our country. Um, we consider it old because it's 300 years old in Europe. That's kind of funny um, because that's the age of a restaurant. Um, but in the United States, that's the oldest. But it is the more kind of culturally kind of conservative part of the U.S. And so when the laws changed about how to invest, the venture capitalists on the East Coast continued to work like they were bankers. But the venture capitalists on the West Coast, they started to work like pirates um, and started doing deals that their, that their cousins on the, on the East Coast thought were, they were crazy. On the East Coast, they would ask you if you were an entrepreneur, well, where'd you go to school? And, and what do your parents do? And, and like, you know, do we know them? And, and um, oh yeah, did you go to school with so-and-so's son? On the West Coast, all they cared about was like, that's a great idea. That'll make us a lot of money. Here, take a million dollars. I mean, where else would that ever have happened? Um, I still remember in my career, people literally threw a check for $4 million across the table at me to take them. Like, do you want a credit card? Do you want to even see where I live? And here, take the check. Where else in the world would, even in the United States, there were very major cultural differences um, between those ecosystems. And I think that was a great A-B test between what happens in different cultures. Did I answer any of your question or did I kind of go off on something? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And uh, is it still um, in place in Silicon Valley, like throwing checks? Uh, throw the oh, well, well um, prior to March 1st, it was worse. You know, I, I teach at Stanford in Silicon Valley and you know, my computer science students, I mean, literally people are standing at the door trying to, were trying to, you know, give them money to do a startup. I mean, you were raising money as students. Um, and if you had a machine learning or AI degree, I mean, you could make millions of dollars at Google or Facebook or for a while um, when that was the hottest thing that you could go do. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of calmed down um, for a while. And I think uh, for a, maybe longer than some of them are going to like, they're all going to be the pandemic graduation uh, students. But, oh, yeah, it was pretty crazy here. It was uh, even worse than the Internet bubble. Um, um, lots of lots of funding. Um, and uh, and what's happened in the last decade or two that accelerated that was new money came in from both ends, uh, meaning in the 20th century, there were traditional venture capitalists who had a, a model of how they would finance companies. But what emerged on the low end was professional seed investors who would fund things way earlier than traditional VCs, who would fund people with just ideas who haven't found what we call product market fit, who were still pivoting and testing, but now they could raise anywhere from half a million to a couple of million dollars just in that phase because it was an interesting idea. It was just crazy. Um, no one would, that used to be called the Series A in, in the 20th century. Now it's seed or pre-seed. And that's new money and new ideas. And at the very high end, you know, we see pension, uh, we see uh, uh, national funds uh, uh, coming in, you know, from countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, uh, traditionally, but the Saudis poured hundreds of billions of dollars uh, into Sun Sun's uh, vision fund and, and other vehicles, et cetera. Um, uh, private equity now kind of, you know, came in as well. So in fact, that, that allowed venture uh, capital and um, companies to defer IPOs, public offerings, because they could now make as more money by deferring um, going public by keeping the company private and just raising additional funds from private capital. Um, and eventually they'd have some liquidity event, but instead of having a $100 million valuation, they would have a $10 billion valuation. But those profits would accrue to the private investors rather than the public markets. So that's what's changed radically. Even though we still call it startups and venture capital and whatever, the, the financial structure that underpins all that just expanded by you know some, some order of magnitude, maybe two, on both ends, and you still have traditional VCs in the center. Uh, the other, uh, just one other thing that's radically changed in my lifetime, which is kind of interesting is, and, and it's relevant here in the pandemic, 
is it used to be that venture capitalists would fund, you know, technology, hardware, software, startups, and what's called the life sciences, therapeutics, medical devices, diagnostics, um, digital stuff. That's essentially been completely bifurcated. They are very different venture funds because the domain expertise required to know something about therapeutics and the business models of those or medical devices are very different than knowing how to you know, do a mobile app or, or a social media. There are still one or two funds that have partners who do both, but most are very specialized. And more importantly, the blogs and the newsletters and everything you read and the conferences, those are like two parallel universes that exist in the same physical cities that don't even know each other exists. But the amount of money being raised, the amount of uh, money being made, equally huge on each side. But if you're in if you're in life sciences, you have very little idea what's going on in social media unless you're a user. And if you're in social media, unless you need a medicine or a, or a test, you have no idea about the ecosystem going on in life sciences. And and I just find that very interesting because I happen to s bridge some of those worlds, uh, uh, both in who I teach and and what I've been interested in and what I invest in. You also invested yourself? You know, I tend to invest in uh, my students or people who've gone through my class. So for anybody who's listening, don't send me a plan uh, unless you've been one of my students. Um, but um, yeah, I invest in a couple of students a year. Um, um, you know, mostly because um, I like them. I know they have know my model. Uh, might not be the right model, but it's my model. So when I talk about pivots or, or you know, business model and whatever, we could have a conversation with without me trying to explain what it is. Every once in a while, I'll make an exception, but uh, um, I, I just do this to keep keep my hand into not being completely stupid about what's going on outside. <laughs>